I got it covered. It's all right. I've got it covered. So, a couple of disclaimers. One is that um, I asked Superior to free to do that because what we really need is for the entire congregation to be a greeting team. We have a formal greeting team, but we want you all to be a greeting team. Second disclaimer, and I want to thank her for doing that. Second disclaimer, um, we'll probably go a little long today. Uh, if you're a sports fan, that's called overtime or extra innings. If you are a music enthusiast and go to concerts, it's called an encore. If you like food, maybe this is a stretch, but we'll call it dessert, okay? <laughs> so with that in mind, grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever. Amen. And now, hear the word of the Lord. Ephesians six ten through 17. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with the truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and to have shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith and with, in which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Have you ever gone into a store unless it was for some costume party or something. Have you ever gone into a store and bought a, some clothing that was two sizes too big to wear to a wonderful event? Anyone here want to admit to that? I will never forget something that happened when I was a teenager. After my freshman year in public school, I decided that I wanted to go to the boarding school in Michigan and I was going to have to work my way. And my family was not rich. And back then, if you were going to a boarding school, you had to have a suit to wear to church. And I was kind of a late bloomer. I was five foot three at the beginning of my sophomore year. About two months in, I started my growth spurt. I needed a new suit. And the only thing my family could come up with was that my older brother had a suit he'd outgrown, and my mom was going to tailor it. She was an amateur seamstress. The problem is, my brother took a size that was long, I took regular. And she did her best, and she cut the sleeves off or, or, and replaced the buttons, and she trimmed off the bottom of the coat, but that meant that the buttons were down, way down here. And it meant that the pockets were down by my waistband. And I never felt comfortable wearing that suit. My brother's hand-me-down suit really didn't fit. And I felt awkward and inadequate. I thought people were laughing at me. And I couldn't wait to get a suit of my own. When Michelle was reading the passage this morning about the armor of God, how many of you felt that you are inadequate to wear the whole armor? Can I see your hands? I see a few honest people. I really did. My experience, I, I felt awkward, I felt inadequate, I felt insecure. To think that I had to wear the metaphorical armor of God and wear it well... I felt like a failure. Now, for those of you who are studying the Sabbath School quarterly, I know it's on Ephesians, 
The primary lesson I'm going to be sharing with you is not in the quarterly I checked. Okay? Doesn't mean the quarterly's bad, it's just they didn't have this aspect. We're told to put on the whole armor of God. Now, I'm not talking about the fact that it fits all refers to how it looks. I'm like my old suit did. It didn't look good. I'm talking about do we feel qualified to wear it? Do we feel qualified to wear it? And I think most of us don't. We're concerned if we have an adequate understanding of the belt of truth. When it comes to the blessed plate of righteousness, all too often I wear the wrong breastplate. It's my own righteousness. When it comes to the gospel sandals, my gospel sandals are made of imitation leather. Looks good, but we kind of cheapen the gospel a little bit by adding what we have to do in order to be saved. When it comes to the shield of faith, all too often I feel that my faith is so small and so weak. I'm like the father that Jesus told him he could cast the demon out of his son if he had faith. And the father responded, well, Lord, I, have faith, I believe, help thou my what? My unbelief. Do you feel that way sometimes too? When it comes to the helmet of salvation, that's the one I feel most secure in most of the time until the devil knocks it off by reminding me of my sin or failure or mistakes or someone in the church reminds me of my sin or failure or mistakes or I can't even forgive myself for my failure and mistakes. Or when it comes to the sword of the spirit, I'm worried that I can adequately explain the scriptures, especially those difficult passages. I'm concerned that I might not rightly divide the word of truth. I'm, I'm concerned that if I'm witnessing to somebody, will I use the right scripture? And so I wonder, do I really have on the whole armor of God? We're going to look at the introduction before Paul ever tells us to put put on the armor, he gives an introduction as to why we need the armor. And the first thing we're going to notice is, it's God's battle. It's God's battle. I want you to notice the, the underlying words. Finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. There are three different words in the Greek used for, that come out strong, be strengthened in his might. To be strong, the first one means to be strengthened by someone else. It's someone strengthening you because you can't strengthen yourself. Going to the spiritual gym isn't really the same as going to the owner of the gym or going to maybe the doctor who can do something for you to help you bulk up in a good way. I want you to notice, it says, be strong in the Lord. It, it's, it's his strength that he gives us. And in the strength of his might, that word for strength means He's the one who provides it. And the word might means he's the one who controls that strength. We can't even control the th strength we're called to have. It comes from the Holy Spirit. And the reason we need to be strong, verse 12 tells us, because, uh, verse 11 tells us, because we may be enabled to stand against the schemes of the devil, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, powers, and authorities, against demonic forces. It's interesting, the word that was used there, it wasn't the word for fight, it wasn't the word for battle, it was the word for wrestle. How do we wrestle? I, I think it's kind of like what Jacob did with the angel there. He, he wrestled with the angel because he was wrestling to quit relying on himself and instead to rely upon God. I don't know about you, but that's my biggest struggle in living the Christian life, is relying on God and not relying on myself. And so it says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, we're wrestling against rulers and powers because those rulers and powers tell us, especially in the age we're living in, you can do it yourself. It's up to you. It's interesting. Remember the story of David and Goliath? Remember when David said, I'll fight? And Saul said, okay, here's my armor. 
they put the armor on David, who was a boy at that time, and the armor was too big. And he says, I can't fight in this armor. It encumbers me. It, it makes, makes my fighting worse. It encumbers me. It, it, it doesn't help me. Instead, he took the armor off and he fought with that which he was familiar with. I don't know about you, but I kind of have felt that way about God's armor. It was too big. It was too heavy. There was too much. There's no way that Gary Tabor could wear it adequately. Or am I the only one? I want you to notice the next thing it tells us about God's battle. Notice it tells us that we are to stand. We are to stand against the schemes in verse 11. Verse 13 says that we are to withstand in the evil done, and having done all, to stand firm and stand therefore. Before it tells us to put the armor on, it says to stand. And that word for stand in the Greek is a military term. It literally means to stand on the ground that has already been won. When it comes to our salvation and living the Christian life, we are to stand on the ground that Jesus won on the cross when he said, it is finished. Do you see that importance of that? We're not in the march in a battle where we're going into a foray where we've got to chase down the enemy. The enemy's trying to chase us down. And so he says to stand, to stand. The second thing we need to notice, yes, it's God's battle. We, we battle in his strength. We wrestle against the desire to rely on ourselves and, and we stand on the ground that's been won. But it's God's armor. It's not your armor. It never becomes your armor. It's not my armor. It never becomes my armor. It is always God's armor. It's always his armor. And all of these are protective, defensive types of armor, including the sword. We'll talk about that in a moment. Stand, therefore, having fastened the belt of truth, it says, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and those shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace, in all circumstances take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit which is the word of God let's look a little bit briefly at some of those pieces of armor what's interesting is every single piece comes to us as a gift from God including our faith every single piece not only does it come as a gift from God but it is part of who God is himself. He's really inviting us to put God on, to be in relationship with him. What's interesting is all of these pieces of the armor are explained in the first part of the book of Ephesians. Paul is telling us how to apply what, what he taught in the book of Ephesians to our, to our lives. I want you to notice there's, there's the belt of truth. And in Ephesians, it tells us that the truth is the truth about Jesus. In Ephesians, it tells us that we are to tell the truth with love. In the, the next piece is, is the breastplate of righteousness. That's the covering that God puts on us, his righteousness, and also the righteousness that the Holy Spirit transforms into our lives so that we're not just not sinning, but also that we're explaining not just that we know what we should and shouldn't do, but that we are being transformed. And the fruit of the Spirit is how we, our lives operate rather than walking in the flesh. That includes love, joy, peace, etc., I want you to notice the gospel of peace, that that's a theme in, in Ephesians. And when we think of peace in the gospel, we think of, I have peace because my sins are forgiven, and that's part of it. But in Ephesians, the gospel of peace is because of the gospel, people who have no business getting along do. And that's good news for us. I, I want you to notice that faith is not just mere belief in a teaching 
But faith is trusting in the God who is faithful. Do you believe that this morning? Faith is trusting in the God who is faithful. The helmet of salvation covers the mind because we are to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. And the sword of the Spirit is a two-edged sword because it, it cuts through our lives both the inward attitudes and the outward behaviors. I, I want to look at four pieces of this armor briefly. I want to look first at the one with the, the shields. Notice how the soldiers are lined up. That's how they did it back then. And there were two shields. There was a really long shield, and this, the short shield. And this is the short shield for when you're in up, up close fighting. And the soldier wouldn't just march by himself and hold the shield in front of himself to protect himself. They would march side by side, and they would hold it so that their shields touched, so that the person on your right would be protecting you from anything from the right, and the person on the left would be protecting you from anything on the left. I, I want you to notice that even there, it's not just about you and your armor, but it includes others. I, I want you to notice the, the, the shoes. It doesn't show real well in there, but they had nails in the bottom of the shoe so that they could stand and plant themselves into the earth earth so that they could stand and, and be, you know, hold on and wrestle against the enemy. The helmet of salvation, the helmet doesn't just cover the mind, it also covered the sides of the head because those are such soft places and even protected the eyes and the neck. And then the sword of the spirit was a small dagger used mostly to defend yourself against the enemy's thrusts. Which leads us to the next point and the main point I want us to get this morning it's God's battle it's God's armor and it goes on God's body where'd I get that from I think we're is, I just want the one that says you on it okay I think we're ahead no C can you go to the next one nope I don't know what happened go, go back okay it says you. You put on the armor of God. It's plural. Ephesians was written to a church, not to individuals. And yes, we can apply it individually, and we should. And we need to try, through God's grace and power, to put on the armor individually. But we cannot completely do it individually. It says you put it on. How does that happen? How does that happen? Well, his body is what? It's the church. It's God's battle. It's God's armor, and it goes on God's body. God's armor fits best when it's put on all of us. When it's put on all of us. I, I want you to notice. I want you to notice we wear the armor best when we wear it together. How is that? I would remind you of something that was very familiar to the Apostle Paul and people back then, but not to us. Soldiers in that day needed armor bearers to put all the armor on. They couldn't carry all their armor themselves. They needed, they needed armor bearers to help them, to strap the, the belt of truth on, to make sure the sword was there. We need armor bearers too. How does that work? There was a lady in sometime in the 80s. Her name was Joyce Landorf. I don't know if anybody remembers her or not. Joyce Landorf was a popular speaker, especially for women. I know about her because my wife enjoyed listening to her. She was very vulnerable. She talked about the difficulties she had with her mom. She talked about the difficulties she had with her husband. She talked about the fact that she was dealing with pain all the time because of TMJ, pain in the jaw. And one day she was at home and she was really almost at the lowest because some of Job's friends, if you catch my meaning, had written her. One of Job's friends told her, the reason you're suffering in pain and having so much difficulty with people is because of the sin in your life. Thank you very much, she said. 
Another said, the reason you're suffering so much is because you don't have enough faith. You need to be a more mature Christian. And all that did was drag her down. And at one of her lowest moments, the phone rang. And a Christian teacher by the name of Keith Korchin called and said, Ju Ju uh, Joyce, last night, in the middle of the night, I woke up and I started praying for you. I prayed for you to have faith. And she said, Keith, I don't have any faith. I prayed, I prayed, and nothing's changed. He said, well, I'll tell you what. I have lots of faith. I'm going to give you some of mine. And when you think you don't have enough faith, just remember I'm praying for you, and I believe God's going to be with you. Her spirits lifted. Hardly did she finish that phone conversation that she called a mutual friend, whom I'm sure most of you have heard of, Chuck Swindoll, a very well-known pastor. And she said, Chuck, you're not going to believe what happened. I was at the lowest depth, and Keith called me. And Keith told me he's going to lend me some of his faith because mine's pretty weak right now. He said, that's wonderful, Joyce. I'll tell you what, I'm going to lend you some of my hope. I've got plenty of hope. And not only that, I know that Jesus has plenty of love, and he'll give you some of his love. Do you catch the point? I had taught this about the armor of God in a Sabbath school class not too terribly long ago. About two weeks later, I got a phone call from a mother who had adopted with her husband some teenage children who were now into college and going through some very difficult times, not being very appreciative of all that had been done for, for them. She was at a very low point, and she said, Pastor Gary, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm just going to throw in the towel. And I said, God's there. He, 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 he'll be there for you. She said, I don't have any faith. And I went, oh, okay, here's my chance. I have faith. I'll give you some of mine. She said, my aunt said that. She'd been in the class. I said, okay, so you got double the faith you need. And I'll give you some perseverance. About three weeks later, I got a phone call. Totally different sounding person. How God had intervened. She said, thanks for the loan. Thanks for the loan. You see, it's, it's not just my idea that we, that's how we put our, the armor on. I, I want you to notice what it says in verse 18. After talking about the armor, Paul says, Pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. have an observation to make two observations one is we don't pray together nearly as often as we should the early church prayed together constantly the early Adventist church prayed together constantly the second is is when we do pray we tend to ask for material blessings and rarely ask for spiritual blessings even in the morning prayer It's a little tougher to ask someone, would you pray for my faith that's weak, than to say, please, please pray for me. I'm going, I've got a sickness I can't overcome. It's a little more vulnerable, a lot more vulnerable to say, I'm struggling against a sin in my life. Can you pray that God would give me the victory? And yet, as you look at the armor of God, those are spiritual things and none of us always has the total amount of faith we need. Nor do we have the, the, all the answers in how we use God's scripture. Nor do we have any. Nor do we have any of the idea that God can use us in the way he can use us. There's one more point that proves that it goes on God's body, the church. In verses 19 to 20, the Apostle Paul asked for help 
in putting on God's whole armor on him. Notice what it says. Pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. If you read between the lines, Paul is saying, pray that I may have the shield of faith and pray that I might have the gospel of peace. As he's in that prison with a guard next to him, thinking about the scripture in Isaiah that talked about the breastplate of righteousness and watching the soldier with his armor. Do you get the point? The title of the sermon was One Size Fits All. God's armor fits us all. But it fits us all together when we pray for one another. And when we're willing to say, my faith is weak, would you pray for me? I've slipped and fell this week, spiritually, would you pray for me? I want to remind you of what it said at the beginning, that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and against the devil and his schemes. There's a text in 1 Peter that talks about how the devil attacks It says, control yourselves and be careful. The devil is your enemy, and he goes around like a roaring lion looking for someone to attack and eat. One of the things my wife and I like to watch is planet Earth. Anybody else with me on that? And it shows how, especially tigers and lions and cheetahs and jaguars, how they stealthily attack. And lions attack by doing two things. They either see someone who's separated from the herd or they look for the sick and the old to take advantage of them. The devil's done a number on the church through COVID by getting us to separate and not be together. We do a number on ourselves when we don't meet frequently together as Hebrews 10 tells us we should. Is it any wonder the devil's having a heyday because we're all so fragmented and trying to do the Christian life on our own? There's a statement that supports this concept. It's from Christ Object Lessons, page 250. Prayer unites us with one another and with God. Prayer brings Jesus to our side and gives to the fainting, perplexed soul new strength to overcome the world the flesh, and the devil. Prayer turns aside the attacks of Satan. Within the Nigel Church family, we need to make a decision that we're going to be a praying church. Not just praying alone in the closet, as important as that is, but praying together for one another. There is a saying The ground is level at the foot of the cross. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. I I want you to notice it's level at the foot of the cross because we are all sinners in need of a Savior. It's level at the foot of the cross because even though we may have been saved some time ago, we still experience the need when we sin or when we make mistakes to come back and seek forgiveness. And while my sin may be different from your sin, they are sin nonetheless. And it's interesting that in Romans chapter 1, Paul links sexual immorality and puts it on the same plane with gossip. Oops. We're all sinners in need of a Savior. This morning, we're going to take the time to practice what I just preached. We have a mission team that's going to be going to Fiji on Monday. And I'm going to ask the mission team to break up into three groups and stand in the center of those aisles. Can you do that right now quickly? Those who are going on the, on the mission trip? Just wherever you right in the center. Back up just a little bit. Right in the smack dab in the center of, this, of the pews. Right there. That's good. 
Any, any of you coming over here? Have a few in the center center, okay? No? All right. Well, we're going to do it this way. All right? I'm going to ask the elders to surround them. And I'm going to, when I pray for them and we put the armor on them, I'm going to ask you to stand and face them, okay? So everyone on this side can face this way or this way, this way or this way. And I'm also going to ask you to commit to praying daily that they can have God's armor put on them as they're on this trip. Let's bow our heads. Stand, please. And let's bow our heads. Our Father in heaven, you are the God of love and the God of compassion. And this team, along with some who aren't here today, are going to be going in your behalf to Fiji to minister in a variety of ways, medically, one-on-one encounters. Lord, you know what they're going to face. And all of them will have different experiences, but we pray that they will together experience the whole armor of God. May they know that when they are there, that we will be praying that the truth about Jesus will be spoken in loving ways to those they encounter and to each other. May they know that we will be praying that as they are there, their lives will be transformed so that they can more adequately reflect you as the God of love. We we pray that they would have the helmet of salvation secure so that even when mistakes are made, your spirit will overcome and your spirit in Christ's righteousness will cover them. We pray that the helmet of salvation will be securely fastened to protect them and that their minds would be clear as they serve. May they know we're praying that while they are there. We pray that the sandals of the gospel of peace might be there to keep them at peace, because sometimes on mission trips, it's easy in living in uncertain places and cramped quarters perhaps. It's easy to start nitpicking at one another. We pray and may they know that we're praying that they would experience the peace that comes from trusting you in every circumstance. We will pray that throughout the week. We pray that they would have the the sword of the Spirit, that when the devil attacks, they would know the words that comes from your word to encourage and strengthen and lift them up. And may they use that word in ways to bless others. May they know we'll be praying that for them. And of course, we pray for safe travel as well. Thank you for their commitment. We look forward to hearing how you will work through this group, through your spirit. And thank you for being with us in this service today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You may be seated.